HGRG here, and welcome to my Morphapalooza! Here's yet another Immortal franchise I'm sure everyone's familiar with by now. Adapted from Toei's Super Sentai series, conceived by the late Jotaro Ishinomori of Cyborg 009 and Master Rider fame, specifically Kyoryu Sentai Jiu Ranger, or Zoo Ranger as it's commonly romanized, Gosei Sentai Dai Ranger, and Ninja Sentai Kaku Ranger, amongst many, Mighty Morphin Power Rangers was conceived and developed by Tony Oliver for Saban, and was aired in the summer of 93 up until the fall of 95. Yes, I was 5 through 7 at the time, for three straight consecutive seasons, thus not only becoming an instant hit, but spawning countless iterations and undergoing numerous alterations in terms of casting, characters, synopsis, and material throughout the decades. Rangers, a miniseries that served as the continuation of Season 3, Zeo, Turbo, In Space, Lost Galaxy, Lightspeed Rescue, Time Force, Wild Force, Ninja Storm, Dino Thunder, SPD, Mystic Force, Operation Overdrive, the list goes on and on and on and fucking on! For the sake of this discussion, however, I'm only tackling the very first and original Power Rangers, the one I've been introduced to and has been long since twitching around in my subconscious, as well as the 20th Century Fox movie adaptation, released in between Seasons 2 and 3, featuring an all-new cast lineup by my dad, the latter of which gained modest to near-harsh reception, notwithstanding what a hit that also turned out to be like its source material. Their respective synopses revolve around the titular team of five, and later six, Angel Grove Kid, summoned by Zordon, portrayed by David Fielding, and his cantankerous droid servant Alpha 5, portrayed physically by Romy J. Scharf, Sandy Selner, and Deneen Kistler for all three seasons individually, and voiced by Richard Stephen Horvitz of Grim Adventures of Billy and Mandy fame, to combat and forever seize the devious threats of Rita Repulsa, originally depicted as Vandora the Red Shot Jew Ranger, portrayed by the late Machiko Soga, and dubbed over by Barbara Goodson, likewise with her American TV counterpart for seasons two and three, and her 95 film counterpart, portrayed by Carla Perez and Julia Cortez, respectively, and her cronies Goldar, aka Graforza, Scorpina aka Lammy, portrayed by Ami Kawai, Finster aka Pleprechaun, Babu aka Toddpad, Squat aka Bookback, all of them are portrayed and voiced by these people listed here. And later, Lord Zed, created especially for this localization and later seasons alone, likewise with the Fox movie, portrayed physically by Ed Neal and Mark Ginther, respectively, while being dubbed over by Robert Axelrod, all of which were accidentally released from their eternal 10 millennium long confinement on the moon, with a raging intent on the conquest of our beloved planet. Who else but our quintessential quintet? Jason Lee Scott, Billy Cranston, Zach Taylor, Kimberly Ann Hart, and Trini Kwan, portrayed by Austin St. John, David Yost, Walter Emanuel Jones, Amy Jo Johnson, and the late Lloyd Trang, God rest her, individually, with Tommy Oliver, portrayed by the illustrious Jason David Frank, later joining them. As for the 20th Century Fox motion picture adaptation, produced in collaboration with Saban and Toei, not counting its sequel Turbo, we see our main sex that, and no, it's not what anyone thinks, this time with the exception of the aforementioned Billy Kim and Tommy, who are still around. They've been joined by three others, even prior to its production, namely Rocky DeSantos, Adam Park, and Aisha Campbell, portrayed by Steve Cardenas, Johnny Young Bosch, whom I met at this year's Kineticon for the record, and Karen Ashley individually, facing new threats in the form of Ivan News, portrayed by Paul Freeman, who you may remember as Belloc and Raiders of the Lost Ark, and Reverend Philip Shooter and Negrites Hot Fuzz, amongst many. A morphological tyrants resurrected from an egg after being buried in locked away in a hyperlock chamber for six straight millenniums by Zordon, in cahoots with an Amazon-like Master Warrior from Phaedos, specifically Dulcea, portrayed by Mr. Nice Guy's Gabriel Fitzpatrick, and a brigade of young crusaders, the Order of Meridian, not to mention his merciless Oozman and Ectomorphicon Titans. In comparison to the TV series, however, the Zords appearing in this adaptation are inspired by yet another Super Sentai show, the aforementioned Kaku Ranger. Rundown aside, we're diving headlong into Sega territory this week, Mighty Morphin Power Rangers and Power Rangers the Movie, both for the Genesis, by Sega, Bandai, and Banpresto, in association with Nova Games and Sims respectively, both released 94 and 95. Hold everything now. Before this four-part analysis goes down, I'd like to pass along my infinite gratitude as usual to Pip Bar Salem, Alan Clark, Colin Koltoff, The Dead Collective, Larson, Hannah, Brock, Tran, Del Rose, Williams, Martin, the list goes on and on, Wiley, Kill Collins, and Mrs. Peel, Disaster Peace Theater, Mac, Arsenault, Moore, Dunn, and others, The Bomber City Historical Society, Ikeda, aka the Michael character, Roe, Enos, Sophia Michael, and local musicians Gianna Botticelli and Sidney Gish, Magic Mike Naughton from Maine, The World of Square, composed of Christensen, Edgerton, Doan, Reardon, Corbett, and Borgella, Tyson and Miranda Markley, The Fantastic Plastics, Gary Summers from Northeast Comic Con, Johnny C, Andrew Palladino from I Think Not, formerly of Everything Ever, Dean Kane of Supergirl and Lois and Clark fame, Char Hart composed of Diamond Machine, Biff and Astro, the Amoroso siblings, Tess and Adam, of course, Pearl and Paquette, Melissa Fiddler and Ray Vasquez, the Lava Buster from Connecticut, Katie Carcel from Nashua, New Hampshire, Sterling Golden from 320 Entertainment, Rob Patillo, Matt Lister and Mickey Brooks from Dover, New Hampshire, Carrie Forbes from Quincy, the Boston Open Screen Committee, Van Voorhees, Ely and Atwood, Brian D. Felice from Braintree, Erica Trimbley from Homespun Pictures, Sam Mulligan, MC Face Palm Doherty, Glenn Ty Dubois, Trelise the Hounds, Don Panzini and Erica Derrickson, the latter now in Thailand, Alana Gordon from Worcester, Joe Lubachum from Providence, Rhode Island, Lame Genie, Salem Wolves, The Lights Out, legendary voice actor and radio personality Billy West, and finally Tony Oliver from Saban, and the entire Power Rangers cast, however much of them are left today. With those out of our system, it's Morphin Time indeed. Upon starting, the story plays out as many would expect, as do the other adaptations. 
But besides that, refer back to what I broke down because I'm not repeating myself. Gameplay and concept-wise, it's an action-infused brawling extravaganza in the tradition of Capcom and SNK Playmore's coin-op titles that won't be mentioned for the sake of time in <laughs> Street Fighter and Fatal Fury, which, for the record, I fondly remember experiencing the most during my youth. A story-based fighter, I might add, in comparison to what we'll be delving into later. Each chapter plays out in two rounds, Rita sends out one of her minions to start all kinds of shit, you select one of the five to confront said minion in question head-on, with the second revolving around Rita using her wand to enlarge him, her, or it as the rangers helm their signature Megazord to confront that very same minion, and wash, rinse, repeat, with the exception of the second chapter involving a brainwashed Tommy and his Dragon Sword, both of which are unlocked following their demise. Concerning the overall itinerary of hostile parties, a cast of familiar enemies make their appearances. If somehow the opposite, you got the Mighty Minotaur, voiced by Tom Weiner, Madame Woe, voiced on the show by Alex Borstein, long before Mad TV and especially Family Guy, and the infamous Catwoman, I might add, Goldar, and finally his merciless badass Zord Cyclopsis, all whose challenges range from Soso to Rat Ass Central, hence our next topic, of course. Control-wise, aside from the D-pad signature migration commands, you know, jumping, crouching, blocking, dashing, and or flipping or dodging, by tapping horizontally twice, etc., you're only limited to using two buttons in the style of the infamous Turtles Tournament Fighters, also on the Genesis release not long before. For performing both a normal and fierce attack, in tandem with the traditional Capcom and SNK-inspired D-pad sequences, some examples include Kim's Dino Arrow and Billy's Dino Lance, Zack's Hurricane Tackle, and his Axe Bin, you know, you tap normal repeatedly, likewise with Tommy's Thunder Dragon, Megazord's Lightning Plasma, Tommy's Dragon Buster, Dragon Zord's Dragon Dynamo Morphing Thrust. The list goes on and on and on and friggin' on. Hell, even you and a companion, or a sibling, can battle out with each of the 12 characters, specifically all 6 Rangers, and their only 2 Zords, plus their 4 attackers, whenever possible, hence the provided versus mode, except you're always taken to the traditional Angel Grove Highway if you pick any of the former, and or Minotaur, Madame Woe, or Goldar, whereas if you picked any of the latter 3 against the 2 Zords or Cyclopsis, you're free to battle anywhere to your heart's content, with the exception of the aforementioned Highway, of course. Limitations much Sega, Bandai, Band, Presto, and Nova? Either way, there's barely any variety between the differentiating areas and or the character movesets at all, barring the Ranger's signature power pistols, of course. The spot-on controls and unequivocal learning curve, however, both have something of a modest attribute to each other given that they don't take much or long to accustom to, and I am NOT bullshitting here. No way. Challenge-wise, please do yourselves a humble favor and refer back to what I stated regarding the enemy confrontations, because as usual, I'm avoiding redundancy like the bubonic motherfucking plague. Besides, conquering the main story mode is doable in at least a half hour, should have been less time. With the exception of the earlier recounted roster of adversaries, Goldar and his Cyclops' sword will all but guarantee your chances for survival are close to dick all if your judgment and wits aren't in top form. In other words, I'd show some serious balls to fire you, or consider myself their bitch. Either way, no matter which Zord you completed the game with, the outcome's always the same. All the dinosaurs join up and fuse with each other into the Merciless Ultra Zord to blast and deteriorate the shit out of Rita's lair once and for all, thus declaring their long-awaited victory. All in all, the challenge is also well balanced and adjustable depending on the player's desired skill level, in conjunction with the structure of the two main modes, you know, just like every other fighter out there, obviously. In spite of the lower hues applied during the design and development process, and the palette swapped character likenesses, save for a few variations, there are sight for sore ass eyes, and a whole lot more. The background designs for each area are diverse, albeit a tad monotonous due to the infinite, endless horizontal scrolling, and the same case applies for the spot on, source material direct cinematic cutscenes, which, for the record, in true Dino Wars fashion, you'll see more often. All the familiar rangers, and especially Kim and Tommy, and even the mech and monster characters, are also recreated and livened to the most appealing degrees fathomable, and above all, aren't something to be mocked at, let alone taken for granted given their respective traits and personalities. In terms of music and sound, conducted by Kenshan and P.E. Young, God knows what the fuck they're supposed to be, each song heard throughout is at least faithful to its source material, like Ron Wasserman's signature theme, for instance, and then some. Granted, they're about as repetitive and insipid as a goddamn kindergarten nursery rhyme, but their qualities at least match those of Setsuo and Keiji Yamamoto. No relation, composers for both Capcom and Nintendo, respectively. In other words, they're beyond headbang worthy. Despite my first impulse to look the other way about the semi annoying sound effects and digitized voice samples, they're still undeniably a thrill to embellish even after all these years. My top 5 favorites from this game alone are as follows, the player in Zord Select, the Angel Grove Highway, the Ranger stage that is, the Volcanic Plains for Dragon Zord stage, the City Landscape at Nighttime for Goldar stage, and finally Rita's Lair on the Moon, that's Cyclops' stage of course. Replayability-wise, it's about as shallow as Hal Larson, get it? 
Due to the earlier discussed short ass story mode, with the exception of the versus mode, to whose features and restrictions I suggest referring back. Either way, despite whatever shortcomings I've disclosed, or many have sniffed out about this game, while many might hate it, and that's understandable, I suppose, I've long since relished and still do even today in full honesty, in this top shelf, if rather incessant and dull, fighting game adaptation of Mighty Morphin Power Rangers for the Genesis, which can be acquired for cheap for the record. Much unlike what we discussed earlier, this Genesis adaptation of the TV series turned Fox film takes on an entirely offbeat concept all its own. Matt Michael, if you'll do the honors? Well, to some degree, this follows the premise of the Fox film adaptation, there are some elements derived from the TV series as well, likewise with the other game adaptations yet to be discussed. In the latter case, not only do you play as any of this game's six initial characters, including the aforementioned Rocky, Adam, and Aisha, Jason, Trini, and Zack take the stage at a later interval. Other than that, however, this Genesis rendition of the Saban franchise turned Fox theatrical hit is a full on, no holds barred brawler. In the vein of Capcom's Final Fight, Sega's Golden Axe, Slash Streets of Rage trilogy, the short lived Technos Japan's Double Dragon and River City Ransom, Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles, and the like, I might add. Thus adding to the enjoyment factor a thousand fold. Within it, you're assuming the control of one or two of the main six. As you're plowing your way through the hordes of Ivan Ooze's Oozman and Rita's standard putty patrollers, amongst other adversaries that stalk Angel Grove and other unusual landscapes, complete with the Zord fights at certain intervals as either the Ninja Megazord, Thunder Megazord, White Tiger Zord, or the Falcon Zord, which quite frankly shit on Ultraman and then some. Regarding the controls, A, B, and or C allows your design ranger to either attack both in person and in their zords, perform a special in both cases, and or jump in ranger form only, or guard in zord mode only, in tandem with the signature d-pad for on-ground movement. With the exception of the same identical flip kick special that all rangers use, which makes you feel like Bruce Lee or Law from Tekken, maybe the first 300 times you use it, holding down your preferred normal attack button avails them the use of their respective individual weapons upon releasing said button, at the cost of a chunk of life I might add. Like most beat em ups obviously. In terms of the rangers differentiating attack slash speed attributes, Rocky and Tommy possess strong attack capabilities in favor of their slow speed. Aisha and the always lovely Kim travel quite fast in favor of their weak ass attack capabilities, whereas Billy and Adam are smack dab in the middle. Thus, experimentation is a huge must if you're willing to tread through this myriad of endless confrontations. Aside from the Usman and the occasional Putty Patrol, the boss lineup consists of Ivan's Ectomorphicon Titans, the Hornetron and the Scorpatron, Goldar, the Scarlet Sentinel Trio, Nimrod alongside AC and DC, aka Necklace, Earring, and Ring based on their original Dire Ranger counterparts, separately and together, Lord Zed, a time altering knight statue, and finally Ivan himself, an Ectomorphicon form no less, fused with the Hornetron, just like the goddamn flick, some of which you have to confront twice, both not only as a ranger, but within their corresponding zords. As ever, expect those pissant bastard fuckwats to send your ass straight to the 80th level of Hell and Beyond if your wits and strategic arrangements aren't in check every goddamn waking moment. In addition, your energy meter will gradually decrease if you spend way too much time in any area, which is why I suggest clearing it in the most reasonable time frame possible. On good thing the Streets of Rage franchise doesn't possess such a severe searing penalty. As repetitive as the gameplay framework is, in terms of the endless enemy wave confrontations, it's not that much of a fucking drag whatsoever, as the fighting engine works quite adequately no matter which role you're assuming or helming, thanks to the stellar control schematics. Your thoughts on the challenge, Matt? While this game, like most beat em ups of the era, gives us something of a friendly welcome from the get go, it'll scramble your intuition, dexterity, and reflexes faster than a side of sunny side omelets near the halfway. And by that, we mean the halfway point, of course. Also, in the words of old O'Reilly Sky 100, to Bencourt, that is, this game will not hold your hand. It treats you like a football player, and you need to hike and move before this game tackles you down. And when it does, you go down hard. Like, no shit, Sherlock. In all seriousness, though, with the exception of the constant Ooze Man and Putty Patroller scraps and the boss confrontations and full Ranger persona, the boss fights within any corresponding Zord are nothing more or less than a recipe for frustration, depending on personal opinion, of course. In my case, while I'm more than able to wipe out the Ectomorphicon Titans as well as the Scarlet Sentinel trio without any conflicts whatsoever, Goldar, Lord Zed, and especially the Ectomorphicon version of Ooze really know how to drive yours truly up the wall at certain intervals and can seriously go fuck themselves sideways while having their root canals performed at their local dentist, listening to Slayer's Ditto Head.
But even those encounters are fuck all compared to the cave area puzzle in order to reach the penultimate. And since we're on that subject, in a few recent playthroughs of mine, I had absolutely no idea you had to break through one of the walls in order to progress. Hence, as the time I ran out while facing off against each endless putty patrol wave after another, my energy drained dramatically. Hence also, the stipulation I established not too long ago. Like seriously banned Presto and Sims? What the shit? All in all, the difficulty here isn't all that mind number whatsoever regardless. Anyways, personal venting aside... Starting out with 5 continues, more of which can be added by acquiring different coins, with the other type refilling your ranger's energy meter, don't be too shit and surprised if they all run out, as both players share the same amount regardless of whether or not either of you started halfway, and yes, the same applies in the SNES game adaptation by Bandai and Natsumi, upon which will be touched later. Besides, should you happen to almost eradicate that morphological motherfucker Ivan in EMC form, the rest of the battle plays out in space as it does in the film, following your congratulatory high score ranking initial entry, of course, except only with the Ninja Falcon Megazord, followed by the thunderous impact of Ryan's comet into his snobby ass and the true outcome of the Rangers' victory. After which, who could have guessed? A random segue into the Angel Grove juice bar, where Bulk and Skull, the two main retarded ass bullies from the show, portrayed by Paul Schreier and Jason Narvey, respectively, yammering on about all the shit that went down to their own fucking theme, no less. While their main six are laughing at the hell up, not giving so much as a Triceratops testicles. You know, just another day in the life, but much more than a tie-in. Some conclusion, eh? Either way, bear in mind those same in-game tips I've thrown out, including but not limited to utilizing each environment to your advantage, as well as alternating your strategic approaches accordingly, depending on which stage area you're in, and use those continues wisely. Your thoughts on the graphics, Michael? Ben Presto, this time alongside Sims, have truly outdone themselves yet again. Each and every main, supporting, and opposing character alike represent their respective source material counterparts, and that's to be expected from any mid to late console lifespan tie-in. No ifs, ands, buts, or maybes there. The overall presentation captures both the overall storylines of the film and the TV show combined, again like other soon-to-be-discussed adaptations, thanks to the civil liberties it upheld in tandem with the vivid, if again muddled, backgrounds of each corresponding stage area. Hell, even the cutscenes throughout the game are quite reminiscent of their source material elements, which is a pretty monumental fucking achievement, thanks as a whole to their brilliant hue usage. Music and sound-wise, composed and arranged by Hikoshi Hashimoto of Racing Hero, AB Cop, Victor Kai's Whip Rush, Alien Storm on the Master System, Running Battle, the infamous Cosmic Carnage on 32X, Sarah Moon S on Game Gear, and Metal Fighter Miku fame, amongst many. Based on the show's soundtrack, of course. While I've been hearing time and time again that the songs aren't as stellar as other Genesis games from the same era, I'll give it that. I'm officially, beyond any doubt whatsoever, going on record saying the and fucking tithesis. Of course, you've got arrangements of the usual show theme, as well as notable other songs from the show, including We Need a Hero, Go Green Ranger, White Ranger Tiger Power, Lord Zed's theme, Power of the Zords, and that aforementioned infamous Bulk and Skull theme, all of which incorporated a diverse range of moods running the gamut from fierce and fervent to just downright nonsensical, well, in the latter choice's case, that is, associated with the corresponding game incidents. The sound effects don't disappoint a smidgen either, and are much more sharp and distinct compared to its predecessor of a fighter, including but not limited to the Rangers' respective grunts when they attack, or the respective Zord names they call out upon selecting one or two of them. And if I were you, I'd listen to these very carefully. Replay value, Matt? Despite the game's relatively short length, if a tad longer than last time, and due to the puzzle-solving capabilities this game offers, as long as you're capable of looking past the former and buckling down to the mandatory, if somewhat mundane, gameplay procedure, you'll be desiring nothing more and or less than to be crawling back into this epic brawl fest time and time again. Therefore, consider your life worth complete jack shit without these two. Well, there you have it, Matt. Now on the goddamn head. Do yourself a favor and take our most valuable advice, as it won't be restated any further. Oh shit, no. Next up, Power Rangers and Power Rangers the movie for the Game Gear. Again, by Sega, Bandai, and Banpresto. This time with Sims developing both of them. In comparison to the previous two Genesis adaptations we've already discussed, these two are somewhere in the vein of single-plane beat-em-up slash fighter hybrids, both of whose plots reflect on their respective source material elements, except they both feature different casts of adversaries while retaining the same ones last time around. 
Just like the first Power Rangers adaptation for the Genesis, the same old Rita summons her minion, thus our heroes counter him, her, or it, after which Rita uses her wand to make that very same minion grow. Thus the hero Zords are then summoned routine applies in both portable renditions, with the latter featuring Lord Zed and his trusty orb, but with a shit ton of Putty Patroller and or Uzman confrontations applying in the former scenario in each stage, except the latter sub-enemies have their own stage. Upon selecting any of the six Rangers, again, five from the get-go, including Jason, Zack, and Trini, and later Tommy, with the latter featuring Rocky, Adam, and Aisha taking their respective places, your myriads of encounters ensue, revolving around not only said scuffles with the Putty Patrol, but also that incessant, insufferable son-of-a-bitch Goldar stealing the show in later scenarios. Control-wise, the same old D-pad functions for the Genesis Fighter based on the show apply here in both versions, in tandem with buttons 1 and 2 for punching and kicking individually. Pushing both buttons simultaneously allows your Ranger, or Zord, or hell, any other character if you're playing in the Versus and or Link modes, the latter of which will be taken up eventually, to perform a special both on ground and in mid-air. The usual Street Fighter-inspired D-pad and button commands also make their resurgence, depending on which character you're playing as. In the latter Fox film-based rendition, however, the bolt next to your character's life bar at the top right corner gradually lights up with every blow you land on your adversaries. Upon flashing, your Ranger and or Zord of choice can pull off an Ultra technique, which can be rather problematic at times, depending on the advanced command inputs being applied. King of Fighters or Street Fighter Alpha much? As far as the traditional enemy lineup, aside from those trademark Humbucket Putty Patrollers and Newsmen, Goldar the Griffin Gimtard, the Evil Green Ranger, and his Dragon Zord, and especially the usual final confrontation with Goldar's own Cyclopsis, the former portable adaptation of the show features King Sphinx, Nasty Knight, Shellshock, and Paludicorn, all of which must be faced twice, and again, both as a Ranger and within their corresponding Zords. Whereas the latter Fox film-based adaptation, aside from Goldar, Ivan Ooze himself, both in his full iconic garb and as the dreaded Ectomorphicon cocksucker we've all grown to despise, and his own Hornetron Ectomorphicon Titan no less, features other adversaries from the show, commanded by that pompous-ass prick Zed, including only Beamcaster and the Jaws of Destruction. While most of these two-part scenarios aren't much to write home about, each and every corresponding character possesses the usual diversity in skill, stamina, and other related yet differentiating attributes that set themselves apart from each other, goddamn if not widely. Hence one of the factors that make the gameplay aspects for both variations unique and versatile like no other. Likewise with responsive, lag-free key control structure, that's for sure. As far as challenge, <laughs> you got me, there's barely much of it at all in full honesty, despite how deterring and agonizing the latter half of both story modes can become at times. I'm looking at you again, Goldar, Putty Patrollers, and especially the Oozmen. As far as helpful hints and tips, refer back to what I took up about the Genesis version based on the show, cause once again remember, fuck self repetition, there's no way in hell I'm reiterating them. Game length wise, both can be beaten in approximately an hour, if possibly in less time, depending on your desired difficulty mode. And to top it off, you're given infinite continues and four continues in both adaptations respectively, despite the latter turning out to be more of a walk in the park by comparison. Graphically, while being dramatically scrutinized and dumbed down from the other versions, the presentation for both Game Gear versions are far from complete eyesores, as many might expect, and do more than piss shit and jizz uncontrollably on those of the second fucking right Game Boy adaptations by Bandai and Tom created in more ways than one. The immense and meticulous detail in the characters, sword mech designs, cutscenes and area backgrounds are top notch as ever, but be prepared to look the other goddamn way in terms of the plausible yet drudging ranger morphing sequences, as they're always shown at the start of each two round chapter, likewise with the sword formations. Overall, remarkable visuals are fucking remarkable. In the music and sound department, composed by Keisuke Nishino, otherwise known as Keisuke, of Tempo Jr. fame, while both versions are borrowed and translated from both their respective source material and console brethren, there's a thin-ass line between magnificent and vexatious. In the case of the first TV show-based variation, there are some original tracks that pretty much work their magic in terms of keeping the fights intense and alive like never before, whereas the latter pales dreadfully in comparison despite being rather tolerable, specifically the corresponding Ranger and Zord battles, the Lord Zed Anthem, and others. The sound effects are a bit dumbed down just like the graphics, and can grate dramatically on one's nerves after an allotted deal of time, minus any voice samples, of course. As far as replayability, notwithstanding their lack of spunk and intensity unlike their Genesis siblings, both the Game Gear renditions are still great, even for an on-the-go guilty pleasure playthrough, and a whole lot more. Now getting back to those two other extra modes, Versus Mode and Link Mode, the latter of which, just like the rest of the two-player Game Gear library, can be accessed if you and or another close individual have secured another handheld, another copy of both games, and a goddamn Link Cable. Consider those an excuse to blow off some steam for the sake of exterminating boredom like a swarm of daddy long leg spiders. Either way, you'd be off your fucking hinges to even contemplate leaving these two handheld brawlathons out in the blistering cold. Last pair of exhibits, and yes, we're diving into Nintendo territory this time, Power Rangers and Power Rangers the Movie, both for the Super NES by Bandai and Natsume, again released both 94 and 95 respectively, just like the other adaptations we've discussed.
nor am intended in advance. What do you know? Another unexpected genre deviation from the other adaptations. Ferguson, the 60-bit hero, take it away. <laughs> Is it morphin' time yet or what? Now I'm your local 16-bit hero, Ian Bergeson. Much unlike those touched upon earlier, these two Super NES variations are full-on, single-plane beat-em-ups complete with platforming thrown into the mix. Upon selecting one of the five, or six in the latter title, it's off to your first mission, and every single one thereafter, whether recreated from the original show, or conceived especially from the two adaptations alone, hence why the latter deviates from the film at certain intervals, splatting those putty patroller pricks senseless, as many might expect, all which appear in different color and weapon varieties, like the Foot Clan from the TMNT, while traveling through perilous ass hurdles and hazards aplenty. In the former TV show-based rendition, the great putties are the normal pawns, wiped out with only one hit, whereas the rest of them brandish guns, knives, swords, maces, etc., wiped out with more than one, possibly a barrage of stronger offenses or advanced normal offenses. Likewise, in the latter motion picture-based rendition, other adversaries include weaponized crafts, battle droids, mad scientists, and the like. And even those take very little to a rather substantial, if daunting, degree of effort to dispatch. As far as the control schematics for both games, the D-pad is used, as ever, to migrate not only your main ranger, horizontally as well as crouch, crawl, etc., and the Megazord later, same shtick except you can only block by holding opposite your enemy's direction, like most fighters. Y and B are for attacking and jumping, respectively, with the latter also being used for performing both a wall leap near any wall, as well as a backflip by tapping twice. Hell, both buttons are also used for combo chaining, mid-air attacks, and special techniques in tandem with the D-pad. Take note, in the latter Fox movie tie-in, only Rocky and Adam are capable of jump kicking with the exception of everyone else. However, that ability is lost Locked instantly, instantly upon, upon morphing. morphing! Buttons A and even L and R do absolute piss-all whatsoever, except the last two Megazord scenes within which L and R are used to make a dash, and X unleashes your Dino Bomb special, only if you're morphed, and Megazord's powers or projectiles depending on its attack power level. In the movie-based adaptation, however, all the controls are the same, except LNR lets you ranger leap between two parallel planes a la Sync Playmore's- <clears throat> that would be SNK Playmore's Fatal Fury. And X not only allows him or her to perform a special- For example, in Adam's case, move the hell over, you. He or she can also morph at will when A, your power meter has been fully increased after collecting each bolt from all vanquished adversaries along the way, or B, reaching the boss in normal human form like in the former, upon which your life's instantaneously recovered. Speaking of, all rangers can also replenish their life by obtaining chicken and first aid kits in the original showbase game, as well as burgers and subs in the motion picture tie-in. Despite the latter two being so, so damn, damn far, far and few between, between it's, it's not even funny. funny, as are the rare one-up icons, then again more lives can be awarded by scoring 30,000 points, but, but we, we digress. digress. Also, if your health gets replenished more in the TV series adaptation, your meter gradually changes color, thus reaching maximum level. Getting back to the morphing process, the original five are capable of doing so upon meeting any boss, as established earlier, in each stage of the first MMPR game, which you'll see your desired character go through in both adaptations for the record. Hell, you're allowed one dino bomb per life as a ranger, and can recover it only once before reaching your target enemy in each of the first five areas, whereas another hyper special is performed while fully morphed, again using X as long as the meter's full, ranging from color and storm themes, screen nukes, light beams, and... Seriously? A, a single, single giant, giant cannonball? cannonball? Before we forget, MMPR the movie on SNES features a two-player co-op mode, while the former TV series tie-in lacks the aforementioned feature. In terms of boss lineups for both installments, the former features Bones, within a secluded recreational area beyond the outskirts of Angel Grove, the gnarly gnome at the factory depot, Eye Guy found deep within the local sewers, just don't expect any turtles crawling around, the genie atop a high-rise building near a construction site, Dark Warrior found within a top-secret lab past the underground caves, all of which are confronted in the guise of your desired rangers, and finally the Mutitis and Trademark 2 form Cyclops' confrontations with the Megazord, near the Industrial Bay Area and outside Rita's Palace on the Moon, respectively. While the latter features other villainous pricks of Zeds from the show, including Mirror Maniac atop the Zeppelin, Cannon Top within an aircraft carrier storage area, Scale Arena near a river away from the snowy mountains while surfing, Magnet Brain along a faraway, partly decrepit railroad following a skirmish aboard a mechanized cargo train, Silverhorn atop the confines of an energy generator lab, the mainframe a heavily guarded brain surrounded by three energy orbs within its own complex. Revenger Shinobi much? 
And finally, Ivan News himself. While most of the former featured cast of bosses in the first game are total pussies, the latter group in the second offering pretty much runs the gamut for bordering on the same level. Up until the halfway point, shit if prior. We are given jack shit but a one-way trip to Red Ass City beyond the outskirts of Crying Foul Valley, surrounded by a river of chameleons, semen, and go piss with a taser strapped to your nuts! And tandem with most of the insane shit you're faced with, hence the focal point of our next customary subject. Control-wise, as ever, they're about as responsive as a toy RC remote with absolutely no setbacks whatsoever. And as dull as the gameplay procedure tends to be, it's far from a huge pain in the taint to grasp. <laughs> you said it, man. Your thoughts on the challenge? Is there anything more to express that hasn't already been done so God knows how many times concerning both titles? In terms of the former TV show tie-in, while it starts out in cakewalk territory, the latter half can really spike up dramatically difficulty-wise. It's not just the hostile parties you confront in between each area, whether in human form or as a ranger, it's more or less the patterns they go through which can be a bitch to telegraph at times, in tandem with the environmental hazards and obstacles for which total, unwavering perseverance, alertness, backbone, and timing are essential. The same applies to the latter, except there, I wouldn't expect much of a milk run considering your ranger's 5 unit health meter, which will dramatically decrease faster than in the former depending on the severity of enemy and or hazard damage you sustain. Starting out with two lives in both games, and in addition, here's the big shit kicker. In the former TV series tie-in, you're also supplied infinite continues, complete with a short and sweet 4-digit number-based password system, and only 4 continues in the latter film tie-ins case, collectively. Don't get discouraged if you find yourself unable to survive every arduous endangerment throughout the course of your journeys, as the challenge is tolerable, if at times vehement. Graphics Bergeson? For yet another pair of 16-bit variations released at the peak of their respective source works on which they're based, the graphics are far from an out-of-place mess of blemishes, or adequate in a manner of speaking, thanks to the diverse array of background scenery designs, some of which have dick all to do with a Fox movie, in the latter version's case, in tandem with the signature sprite depictions and animations of all the key protagonists and their opposing adversaries. While the latter represents those of their source material, despite again not having much to do with, the former announced cast, however, is a whole different goddamn story. Except for everyone else, Billy in both adaptations, and especially Zack in the TV series adaptation, are a tad off by a hair's whisker in terms of both on the timid yet eager geek stereotype. Move, Move over, over Lester the unlikely. unlikely, and the infamous blackface syndrome crossed with the dance-oriented techniques, respectively. And to top it off, whenever the main five, or again six, morph into their suits, they're pretty much palette swap versions of Jason. Or Rocky in the latter movie Titans case. Complete with a perpetual case of roid rage. Same story with the ladies, specifically Trini slash Aisha and Kim. Minus, minus her, her fucking, fucking skirt. skirt. Likewise in the Game Boy iterations. Seriously, how unnatural are these depictions? And did Natsumi even bother to watch the show more often prior to development? Either way, notwithstanding those obvious can't-miss slip-ups, the overall visual presentations for both incarnations have never disappointed. And, and will never, never disappoint, disappoint even, even if they're, they're given, given purposes, purposes dependent, dependent on it. As always, in the music and sound department, orchestrated for both games by the combined efforts of Kanuyo Yamashita of Castlevania, Power Blade 1 and 2, Mega Man The Wily Wars, Pocket Rocky 2 and Mega Man X3 fame, and Iku Mizutani of Konami's Russian Attack, Taito's Dungeon Magic, Shadow of the Ninja, Tailgater, Shatterhand, Jetman, Dragon Fighter, and the Jets and Coxwell's Caper fame, with the latter Fox film tie-in by Hiroyuki Watsuki of Ninja Warriors, Pocket Rocky, Omega 5, the aforementioned Jetman and Tailgater, Smaggy's Quest fame, etc. Hell, he was even the sound designer for the earlier recounted Shatterhand, and the original previous Power Rangers on Super NES, alongside Haru Ohashi, who's been collaborating with Iwatsuki on various other Natsume works, including the aforementioned Pocket Rocky 2, Power Rangers The Fighting Edition, which by the way was out the same year as the latter Fox film tie-in, Zeo Battle Racers, Wild Guns, and Gundam Wing Endless Duel. The differentiated arrangements of the show's theme are magnificent in every true sense of the word, with the TV series tie-in featuring two different variations of said arrangements, one with vocals heard at the beginning and during the Megazord summoning sequence between areas 5 and 6, and the other, an instrumental heard during the last two areas, whereas the latter movie tie-in contains the extended version of the theme, again heard at the beginning, thereby segueing into the introductory cast demo, minus the vocals. And how can we possibly forget about the multitude of in-game exclusive songs, in tandem with their individual boss themes, some of which have variations on the show's theme no less? The sound effects, despite being rather flat and grating with a raging case of reverb arama in the case of the attack and damage incidents, of course, are nothing short of gratifying whatsoever. Now, our top 5 favorites from both games are as follows. For the TV show tie-in, stages 1, 2, 3, 5, and the boss theme, with an honorable mention aiming towards the end credits. And concerning the Fox movie tie-in, stages 2, 4, 6, and both boss themes, one for the first 6 altercations, and the other for Ivan News. Your thoughts on the replayability 16-bit hero? While the former TV series tie-in doesn't offer anything much in terms of challenge unlike the latter, except a series of three four-digit passwords at the end which grant you a versus mode in which you and a companion duke it out as the Megazord and its adversaries, 
and notwithstanding the semi-repetitive nature of both games, Mighty Morphin Power Rangers and Mighty Morphin Power Rangers the movie on Super NES are definitely worth playing and mastering time and time again no matter which role or two you assume. Both costing around eight to nineteen dollars and eighteen to fifty-five dollars loose, respectively. You have done well, my sixty-bit comrade. And if I were you, I'd make every effort to track down these two beat 'em ups and a whole lot more. Because for those that haven't experienced them, you're really missing the hell out. Therefore, what's my final verdict on every Power Rangers game discussed so far? There are no words, no words to express that haven't already been done so about each and every single one of them, notwithstanding each and every downside in or setback thrown out there. Hell, even if you're not a religious Power Rangers fan, like some of us are, yours truly included, I'd do myself a noble favor, get my ass the hell out there, and track some of them down, though there are some to avoid, which will also be noted in my honorable slash dishonorable mentions lineup. Before I conclude this completely, I'd like to take this opportunity and thank both Matt Michael and Ian Bergeson, the latter from 16-Bit Heroes and The Offseason, for joining yours truly on this excellent adventure which shits on Billin's head and then some. <laughs> oh, for those not in the know, Matt Lister's put out a new album, The Sweet Christmas, containing covers of all your favorite holiday tunes, available not only on Bandcamp, but in the iTunes Store, and especially Spotify, on his physical CD copies, whenever available. Until then, a belated yet happy and more phenomenal new year. Keep the fluctuating power on all day, all night, 24-7-365. This is the Hardcore Retro God not only morphing out, but also signing the hell off. <laughs>